Today we're taking a look at The Sovereign by Dark Sword Armory. This sword is absolutely stunning. It looks like something Jamie Lannister would carry in season one of Game of Thrones. Hold on, hold on, this is my best uh, Jamie Lannister impression. Thanks for joining me guys. This is our second review of a Dark Sword Armory sword. If you're interested in seeing our first one, it was on the Dark Sword Armory Gothic two-handed long sword. Really good review by the way. I will link that down below, but their second sword is something truly unique. Look at that guard. Look at the pommel. This is a really pretty blade. This is their Sovereign Sword, which is, um, I guess, an arming sword. They, they classify it as an arming sword. I'll get to classifications and, and what I think it best fits in terms of roles later on, but it is classified as an arming sword, which is a one-handed European sword. Uh, arming swords typically were used with things like shields or bucklers, but they could also be used by themselves. And weight lengthwise, this does fall within the, uh, the parameters of what an arming sword is supposed to be. But look at the decorations that they have put on this sword. Really, really pretty. It is solid bronze, I believe, on both the pommel and the, uh, and the cross guard. And the cross guard has a French floral motif to it. Um, really, really pretty. And that pommel, that vortexing pommel is uh, beautiful. It's just really unique. And anytime I've brought this thing out, people have just asked what it was because it doesn't look like a normal run of the mill European blade. I mean, neither, neither does this. This looks pretty fancy too. But if I was to pull out something a little more Spartan, like something like this Techniques Fetter here, this looks very, it's like the first sword you get in a video game as opposed to this. This is like some, mid to top tier level item you would find uh, on maybe a boss you defeated. So really cool. Its blade is modeled after a type 18 blade, which is very similar to their long sword here, but that is a diamond cross section and it is hollow ground. It did come reasonably sharp. It's still reasonably sharp. Uh, I'll get to cutting a little later on and I'll tell you how well it cut, but it came sharp enough to, to cut with. And it's still relatively sharp after the cutting we did. Now, Dark Sword Armory claims that this is an arming sword, and it is an arming sword. It falls within the length and weight parameters that arming swords were typically found in. But when I pick this sword up, it does not feel like a dedicated one-handed sword. It, it feels kind of like a hand and a half sword. Now, if you look at this pommel, this vortexing pommel, this was actually taken from, I believe, part of the collection of one of the owners of Dark Sword Armory, and it was taken from a 15th century Katzbulger in his collection. Now, Katzbulger is typically a one-handed sword as well, so it kind of makes sense that it could be transferred over to an arming sword, but I typically see these kinds of pommels on long swords and hand and half swords, so I've never seen one on an arming sword before, but it lends the shape of this coming down here and the way that the pommel tapers, it makes for holding in two hands very, very comfortable, which is why I feel like this sword, I don't know, I feel like this sword feels more like a hand and a half or bastard sword, even though the length of the blade is with an arming sword. Now, if I hold this sword against the long sword, you can tell that there is a significant length difference. So even when I'm holding them like this, let's see if I can get this on camera, I'm holding this quill on to quill on, and you can see that's a, that's a pretty big difference, and the long sword blade is slightly broader. I'll get to exact measurements in a little bit, but when I swing this sword around, it feels a little front heavy. I can definitely do it one-handed, and it's responsive. I, can do, I can't do it indoors too much because I'll hit stuff, but I will post some video showing how I move with this sword one-handed and two-handed. But having used arming swords before, this is not the most responsive arming sword I've ever used. But when I put two hands on this sword, that's when this thing really comes alive. It just feels extremely responsive. Um, I test that a lot when using a buckler. 
because with a buckler, I don't have a choice. I have to use this one-handed. And I can feel that it's, it's not impossible to stop on a dime, but when you're using a buckler, I'm very concerned about penetrative power, point control, and the speed of the blade moving and going from one side of the opponent to the other. And this sword is not sluggish. It's just not as responsive as I thought it would be for an arming sword. It just feels like a really well-balanced, albeit slightly shorter, bastard sword or hand and a half sword. This is most likely due to the forward point of balance. This is not a heavy sword by any means. The point of balance is a little more forward than I would like in an arming sword. Now again, that's just my personal opinion of the sword. Arming swords and long swords and bastard swords were on a spectrum, right? So while we have the oak shot typology to kind of work off of now, they would flow from one to the other and a lot of times there really wasn't any name for that kind of sword. So this is definitely historically plausible. A good comparison that I have for a one-handed sword is my Lands Connect Emporium Gottfried Messer, which as you can see, it has a shorter pommel on there. It is extremely light in the hands. I can move it around everywhere and that's because the point of balance is of course a little bit closer. Um, the blade is probably slightly thinner. No, actually it's, it's very close in uh, thickness. I think the distal taper is a little more extreme towards the end, whereas I can feel this one where I, I have to put the brakes on it with my hands and I can feel the tension in my arm, which of course fatigues me over time. This one, all day, all day I could move around with it. But these are technically both one-handed European swords that you could use with or without a buckler or shield. Now in terms of exact weight, uh, my scale shows this right at two and a half pounds, so it's a little off from the sight, but uh, these are handmade blades, so they're gonna vary a little bit. And uh, let's check that distal taper real quick. So right at the Wicasso, we're looking at about seven millimeters for that. And then right at the tip, about 4.1 millimeters. So definite distal taper there. Now when you buy this sword, you can get it sharpened or unsharpened, and it does come with a scabbard. Again, something that I love about Dark Sword Armory is they provide you with a scabbard for a relatively low price. And just like their long sword, it's wood cord and it's leather wrapped with decent quality leather. Uh, I really like the style of scabbards that Dark Sword Armory has with their swords, and that looks very handsome. I like it a lot. It has the same belt system that came with the long sword. In fact, the scabbard that came with the Sovereign looks almost identical to the scabbard that came with the two-handed Gothic sword. I believe that Dark Sword Armory pretty much reuses the same template and just sizes them a little different. And I don't fault them for that. However, for the price that you pay, one little complaint I have is that I would like something a little more unique on each different sword. I know that it makes them more expensive. That's just a personal like, but from a business standpoint, I totally understand it. And these are not cookie cutter, cheap, poorly made scabbards. These are high quality wood cord, metal shaped with decent quality leather. And if you pay a little extra, you get their belt. Um, I personally don't care for this belt because, not because it's a bad belt, but because I have my own belt that I like to slide my sword, different swords into so I can switch from one sword to the other a little bit faster and without having to take any of this off. But the belt system itself is very, very, very good. It's just like the same one on the long sword. If you watched the previous video, it holds the sword at a really, really good angle about right here. So that it won't move once you put this on. And I think that that's uh, really, really nice. Um, I did say in the last video that this was an ahistorical example. However, I have seen other examples of sword belts, um, antique sword belts attached to scabbards that look kind of like this. So I uh, take that back. This may have a little more uh, historic legitimacy than I thought. Now where this sword shines in my longsword class is with my female students. They absolutely adored this sword, not just because it's extremely ornate, but because for their smaller hands and shorter size, it made a little more sense for them to use a sword like this 
than a full-size longsword like this one. They found that they could still put two hands comfortably on the blade, and the sword was, of course, extremely responsive in their hands. Check out what Kara has to say about it the first time she picked it up. It's, it cuts really smooth. Yeah. Like it has like no effort whatsoever. For someone my size, you need to have two hands so I can do all the kind of moves I would usually do with my, like my normal sword. So this is really a great sword. <laughs> On to cutting with the sovereign. This thing cuts through milk jugs, arguably our easiest target, like they don't even exist. On the back slash using a weaker cut, using the back edge, it's the same result and normally these types of cuts are much harder to go through completely. Two liters and water bottles are where your edge alignment matters more. If you don't align properly, you will usually send them flying off the target stand, sometimes without even cutting them at all. But as you can see, the Sovereign does cut through them with relative ease, so long as you do your part with edge alignment. Now we're getting into three C's territory. These are our thicker targets, starting with a bottle of pre-workout. Swing. Swing through. And we wouldn't be doing the pre-workout justice if we didn't include a giant bottle of protein powder. This giant jug of cat litter is something I didn't think I would actually go through because it's relatively thick and it's big, but it went through with one cut. The edge is absolutely immaculate. Plastic didn't do anything to deform it. I don't feel any burrs. I don't know if it's gonna focus in and you can see it. Right there, there's nothing wrong with that edge at all. So far, so good. The Sovereign has some serious piercing power. The tip shape and the strength of the tip just make this thing go through every single bottle that I stabbed at, including some very thick Arizona sweet tea bottles. Those tend to be one of the harder bottles to stab through, but this thing went through with actually very little force. I was uh, overdoing the force in the beginning, but near the end I realized I didn't really have to even shove the sword through it that hard. Now just like I did with the two-handed gothic longsword, it cuts through quarter inch to one inch branches with ease so long as they are green wood. And I was able to do this one-handed and two-handed. This is on a bush that we plan on removing anyway, so it makes a good test method. The last test I did is something I would not recommend you do on your sword because it could damage it, but I wanted to see if I could damage the edges at all or at least roll them. So I found a hardwood log in our fire pit and just started banging away at it to see if I could damage the blade. Let's see how much of a mess I made of the Sovereign. As you can see, there's a lot of sap and smudge marks, possibly even some scratches here, but we're gonna use some Flitz polishing solution and see if I can make this thing look like it's brand new. Just incredible. It's already looking like nothing was done to the blade at all. Let's flip it over and see what it looks like compared. You can see the big difference between the tarnished side and the polished side. Flitz is such a good way to clean your sword off. Let's go on and take care of the other side and make this whole sword shiny again.
there weren't very many scratches on the blade after we polished it. There were some light marks, probably from when I was hitting it on the log, but there was no deformation on the edge, and there were no deep scratches. That just shows that this blade is pretty hard, well-made, and the cutting edge is very robust. Let's add some oil to finish it off and make sure we protect the blade from further rust. And look at that shine. It's almost as shiny as when I pulled it out of the scabbard for the first time. All right, so there's a lot I like about the Sovereign. Let's talk about a few things I do not like about this sword. The very first one, and it's a minor nitpicky thing, it is this shelf going from the vortexing pommel to the actual grip itself. It's very abrupt. It doesn't look like this was uh, tailored for this pommel. It almost looks like a, a little bit like an afterthought, like it was just bolted on last second. And it's just because it's very drastic. It's just this cutoff right there. It's a minor complaint because honestly, I don't feel it in the hands. So if it doesn't matter to you functionally, you're, you're not really gonna notice it. And the sword is so gorgeous that honestly, it's only because I own this sword that I noticed this. But that's just one complaint. My second complaint is one that I had with the two-handed gothic sword, and that is this triangular shape of the, of the cross guard is not really my thing. I don't like the fact that using a thumbs up grip is more difficult. And now with these embellishments, these French uh, floral embellishments, I definitely feel it on my thumb when I'm using a thumbs up grip for Spurk or any of the other techniques that I use. Um, still not a fan, but I understand aesthetically and probably to make a, a different mold altogether, it's probably expensive. And my last complaint is actually with the scabbard. And here, I'm gonna show it to you real quick. I'm gonna show you a size difference. All right, I'm looking at the two swords and the Sovereign, as you might remember, is supposed to be smaller, but it doesn't look smaller right now. Why does it look like a long sword? Why does it look as tall as my long sword? This is definitely because this is some form of reused scabbard. Um, and I, this might have been just for the sample that they sent me. I'm not sure, but this scabbard is longer than the scabbard that comes with my longsword for an arming sword. That doesn't make much sense, right? This should be a lot smaller. And in fact, if I put this back to back and I look at where this blade stops and it stops right there, this is far too long. This is far too long for this sword. So I don't like the fact that this scabbard really wasn't made specifically for this sword, because when I carry this thing around, it feels like I'm carrying around a great big long sword. So what do I think? Is the Sovereign worth it? Well, at the time of this review, you can get the Sovereign for anywhere from 610 US dollars to 770 US dollars, depending on the package you want. Whether you want the sword sharpened, it comes with the scabbard with the belt or without the belt, it's up to you. But at the cheapest, it's gonna be at 610, the most expensive at 770. And at that price range, I do believe that this sword is worth it. It is a super, super tough blade. We did a lot of things that I would never, ever recommend anyone do to test their swords. And I still don't even feel a burr. That's the crazy part. There's no burrs or anything on the blade. And the blade itself is really nice. It has an almost indiscernible bevel. So there's, just like their long sword, I don't see an ugly secondary bevel. And even hitting hardwood with it, I don't have any dings on the blade, which is pretty awesome. Just like their other swords, you also get the scabbard. I think that that alone makes most of their swords worth it. I think the steel choice and the heat treat of the blade is exceptional. And aside from mostly cosmetic complaints, I don't have too many on this blade. I just really don't like the triangular uh, cross guard here and I don't like this little shelf right here and I wish the scabbard was just a little bit more tailored to the sword. But overall, I really just like this sword. I think it's a super versatile sword that you can use one-handed, two-handed. Different types of HEMA students of different sizes can use this sword and feel good about doing it. 
And quite honestly, you look like old money with this sword. You could probably tell everybody what your daddy does without having to say a single word. You're definitely going to get targeted on the battlefield first, because people people are definitely going to want to ransom you off after you have this. This looks decadent. Guys, if you like that review and you want to see more reviews of other swords, like, subscribe, and or comment down below. Your comments please the algorithm gods, the old ones, and in turn, I get to have a good night's sleep. So comment down below what you think of the Sovereign, and we'll catch you on the next one. See ya.